Welcome to class, everyone. Praise the Lord. And thank you, Jeffina, John, Paul, for joining class. I thought I saw Anita. This, okay, maybe lost the connection. Uh, thank you for joining class. Also, uh, like to welcome our e-learning um, students who will join this class uh, uh, later on or listen to these lectures later on. Um, thank you all. Uh, this morning, we will um, begin our study of Romans chapter 10. So before we do that, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Let's uh, pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this um, morning that you have given us. Lord, we come before your presence and ask, O oh God, this morning that you would speak to us and help us to understand from your word. Uh, unite our hearts together, God, that we would be able to understand your word with its power, with its fullness, O oh God, and be able to apply in our lives. And help us to be channels of your blessing to people around us as we God. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. Um, so we'll begin our study of Romans chapter 10. Uh, can one of you please read Romans 10 verses 1 through to verse 5, please? Romans 10 verses 1 to 5. Anyone would like to read? Okay. I'll read. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So here we see that, you know, Paul uh, begins this uh, uh, chapter 10 the same way that he begins uh, chapter 9. So he repeats what he has basically said in the beginning of chapter 9. Uh, what he really wants in his heart or what his heart's desire is that Jewish people be uh, saved. Okay. Now, Paul was a very staunch Jew and he had come to faith. Um, uh, in Christ, and we know that he, he encountered Christ in a very powerful way, uh, which brought about a powerful or a significant transformation in his life. And now he's desiring the same thing for the rest of the Jewish people, that they too will have an encounter with this living uh, God and also will have a significant transformation in their uh, life. So that is his desire. That is his deep down longing and desire. Verse 2, he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So he's saying that Jewish people are very zealous for God. But the, the saddest thing is that they don't have the right knowledge because they're so blinded by the truth. Their eyes have not op been opened to the truth um, that is in Jesus Christ. So their eyes have not been opened to the truth and they don't want uh, to be open, uh, their eyes to be open to the truth and they're blinded to the truth. Verse 3 for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So he's saying they are ignorant about how to receive God's righteousness. They're going about and trying to establish their own righteousness by keeping the law and they haven't received a revelation of how they can receive righteousness through Jesus Christ. 
verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Paul is saying that Christ is the end of the law, which means all of the law was given for one reason, to bring us to Christ, to lead us to Christ. So how um, does the law that was given lead us to Christ? Because people knew that they could not keep the law. There was no way they were competent enough or, you know, they were struggling to, to keep the law. They just couldn't keep the law. And they knew that they needed someone to help them uh, to keep the law. So the, uh, everything in the Old Testament, whether it was the sacrifices, uh, whether it's the laws, whether it was uh, the rituals, everything was actually like a type and a shadow. It was uh, pointing out to Jesus Christ who would come and in him all of these all of the law all of the sacrifices all of the uh, sacrifices in the temple the rituals everything everything would have sense meaning and purpose uh, through the work and the life um, or the person and the work of Jesus Christ so all of the law is speaking of one person which is Jesus Christ and all of the law is fulfilled and met in one person and that is Jesus Christ okay so it is through him that you know uh, it is only through Christ that righteousness is possible for everyone With, and without Christ you know no one can be made righteous verse 5 for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law the man who does those things shall live by them. Okay. So Moses said, if you want righteousness, you know, by the law, you have to live by the law. And this was very difficult because, you know, uh, if you end up breaking at least one of the many laws, it's like you've broken the whole law. Okay. So if you break one law, you have broken the whole law. So the option of getting righteousness by keeping the law is not available. So the only way of receiving righteousness is through Christ Jesus. But, you know, the Jews are not willing to see that or receive that. Now, in verse 6 onwards, Paul goes on to talk about righteousness by faith. And he says, people who receive righteousness by faith, how do they live so that is what he goes on to talk in verses uh, 6 onwards so can somebody please read verses 6 to verse 13 please anyone can read verses 6 to verse 13 But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will ascend to the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all, uh, the, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So verse 6 um, of Romans chapter 10 says, But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. And uh, verse 7, Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So it says those who receive righteousness by faith speak this way. Okay, so Paul is saying, how do they speak? And he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 to 14. So if you read from verse 11 onwards, it says, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. 
It's not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. So here Moses uh, is speaking to the people of Israel and Moses is telling the people the commandment and the law is not mysterious. It's not as mysterious as how heaven is mysterious to us or the sea how it is mysterious uh, that you cannot understand but he's saying it's close to you, it's in your heart, in your mouth for you to do it. Okay. And verse 8 but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, if you look at what Moses says, he says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, which I read, he says, For this commandment which I command you today is not mysterious for you, nor is it far off. So what Moses is saying is he's talking about the commandment or the law. But Paul, instead of saying commandment, or law, he says the word, okay? And he says the word of faith which we preach, the word of faith which Paul is preaching, he says the word is near you. So you need to notice the difference. Paul, Paul is talking about the word and Moses is talking about the, he's not using commandment, but he's using the word which he preaches, unlike Moses saying commandment or the law. So uh, he's replacing commandment with Christ because he has he has just mentioned to us uh, uh, in the preceding uh, verses that Christ is the end of the law. Okay, Christ is the end of the law in verse four. So he says, "For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes." So in that context, he's replacing, replacing commandment with Christ. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, he's replacing the commandment with the law or law with Jesus Christ. So what is Paul really trying to say here? He's saying the way God wants us to live hasn't changed. Okay. He wants us to keep his word in our heart and in our mouth. Why does he want us to keep it in our heart and in our mouth? What happens if God's word is in our heart and mouth? What happens if the God's word is in our heart and mouth? We will do it, right? That's why Jesus says, uh, God says in the Old Testament, I will remove your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon your hearts and minds, and I will put my Holy Spirit, and he will help you to do everything written in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to follow him or to obey his commandments. Okay? So what is the need to keep God's word in our heart and mouth when it's in our heart and mouth we are constantly doing what his word requires us, uh, of us. So what has changed is the word that we keep. Okay, so what has changed is the word that we keep. In the Old Testament it is the law and in the New Testament it's the message of Jesus Christ. It's the word of faith that we which very interesting here. Okay, so Paul is saying that you know God wants us to keep His word and mouth in our heart in order to do it, and uh, the way God wants us to do it hasn't changed. But only what has changed is the word that we keep. In the Old Testament, it is the law, and the New Testament is the message of Jesus Christ, the word of faith which we preach. Okay, so the word of Christ, the word of faith. The teaching of Jesus is basically who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he has made available to us. So what is the word? It's basically teaching of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he has made available. And Paul is saying Christ is not far away or deep down, but he's right near you. Okay, What is right near you? He says it's the word of faith and the message of Jesus Christ. So who is Christ, what he has done, what he has made available for you, that is the message, that is the word that we keep in our heart and in our mouth.
And then he explains to us something in verses 9 and verse 10, something which he's not mentioned in Deuteronomy, uh, which I read, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses um, 11 to uh, 14. He basically, Paul is explaining here in verses 9 and 10, which is not mentioned in Deuteronomy, he explains the dynamics of how this works. He's saying that he's talking about the inner details of keeping the word in our heart, in our mouth. And how does it work? In verse 9, he says, you know, if we confess with our mouth, he's, look again, he's saying not the commandment or the law, but he says we confess with our mouth that the Lord, uh, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so if you believe who this Christ is and what he has done, you know, and what he has uh, purchased for us, what we have, um, he's made available for us, you know, then he says we will experience salvation. Okay, verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, so verse 10, it says, for with the heart one believes with righteousness. So what does God want us to keep? Uh, why does God want us to keep his um, uh, word in our heart? It's because we believe in our heart. Okay, You believe that word. You believe who Christ is. You believe what he has done. You believe his message and you believe in your heart. So when you believe in your heart, it puts you in the right place. It puts you in the right standing with God. You are in a position where you are rightly positioned in Christ. You are in a right standing with Christ. So it says, with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made, which results in salvation. Okay. So those who receive a righteousness by faith, we, we should speak like this. You know, we believe in our heart and we speak in our mouth okay we speak in our mouth who jesus is what he has done uh, which is the message of christ the word of faith which paul says we have been speaking and preaching about this okay he says we do not speak as though christ is far away in heaven and dead and deep down in the earth but he says the message is right there it's in your heart and in your mouth and when the confession this confession is not about saying it once, uh, like, you know, God tells uh, Moses in Deuteronomy, it's not just say it once and then forget it. It's not a one-time confession, but it's a way of life. It is believing and confessing, believing and confessing. It's believing who Jesus is, uh, what he has done. It is confessing who Jesus is, what he has done, what he has purchased for us, made available for us. And it's a way of life. It's a lifestyle that we live. We are continually believing in our heart, confessing in our mouth what Jesus has accomplished in our lives through his death, burial, uh, resurrection, ascension, and him being seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, what does this mean for us? Or what does it mean to us? That those who have received righteousness by faith, they always speak the word of faith. Okay? They always speak the message of who Jesus is and what he has done. Okay? So it's time for us to examine what we are speaking from our mouth. It's time to examine what we are believing in our heart. Are we speaking words of faith? Um, uh, are we speaking what Jesus has done for us, who he is to us, what he has done for us, what he has accomplished for us, what he's made available for us? And when we believe in our heart and when we speak or confess with our mouth, we're actually, what we are doing is we are putting ourselves in the right place, the right standing, where we can experience who Christ is. Okay. Now, the word confession in Greek means to say the same thing. Okay? Confessing means saying the same thing over and over again, which means we speak in agreement with who God is, who Jesus is, what he has done, what he has made available for us. 
okay what he has done for us on the cross through his death burial resurrection you know so i'm saying the same thing and i'm not saying anything contrary to who he is and what he has done okay jesus in matthew chapter 10 verse 32 says if you confess me before men i will confess you before my father in heaven okay if you um uh, you know, uh, deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. So if we say, you know, if we confess who Christ is uh, to us, then, you know, the Father will declare us, you know, um, or if we say who Christ is to us, then Jesus will declare this to us that he is our healer, he is our deliverer, he is our sustainer, he is the one who provides for us. So Paul is saying that this word of faith or this message of Jesus Christ, what he did through his death, burial and resurrection has to reach all people. Everyone needs to know about this, you know, and he says anyone and everyone can have access to this. And he says anyone and everyone who hears this message and who calls in the name of Jesus will be saved and God will respond to all of them. Okay, so that is what he uh, states in um, in verses um, six onwards, six to verse thirteen. Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, verse 11, he says, For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So who is the one who believes? Verse 12, he says, both Jews and Greeks. Okay, uh, Jews were who think they are chosen people and Gentiles who they think will not be part of the messianic banquet, will not be part of the kingdom of God. But he says, everyone who believes will be saved. And he says, whoever calls, whether Jews or Gentiles, will be uh, uh, who call in the name of the Lord will be saved and they will not be put to uh, shame. Okay, so that is uh, till verse 13, verses 14 to 21. Paul, you know, um, um, it's a, he shares about, he motivates us that the message of Jesus Christ has to go out to each and every one. So that is what we will look at in verses. Um, 14 to 21. So can somebody please read verse 14 to 21, please? Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Yes, go ahead till verse 21, Rosalind, please. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So he says, you know, Paul is basically saying, you know, how can anyone believe if they haven't heard the gospel. Yes, all those who call on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. That is what he, uh, you know, um, he ends off in um, uh, verses 13, says whoever calls the name of the Lord will be saved. But he goes on to say, hey, how can people believe, 
you know, or how can they confess with their mouth if they haven't heard? And how can they hear without somebody going and preaching the word? And how can the person preach unless he has been sent? So somebody has to send them out. Okay, so verses 14 and 15 are, are like classic texts to encourage people for mission. In verse 15, Paul is quoting from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. And um, verse 16, Paul is quoting from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Okay, and from Isaiah, he says, how beautiful, he quotes and he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So, it says, not everyone believed when, you know, uh, when the preacher was sent and when people heard, but Isaiah himself says, Lord, who has believed our report? So Paul is saying that, you know, even as we go and preach and teach, there will be people, not everyone who would, you know, receive the preacher uh, or will listen because Isaiah himself prophesies and says, you know, who has believed our report. So not everyone will believe, but that does not mean that we don't go and preach and preach, but we need to do our responsibility. We need to preach the gospel because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then he asks, you know, uh, two rhetorical questions in verses 18 and 19 uh, concerning um, Israel, like he has done in the past. He says, haven't they not heard? So he's saying, yes, they have heard the good news, right? The good news of the gospel has been preached to them. Did Israel not know? Yes, you know, Israel did not know, but they have heard the gospel. So in verses 18 and 19 and 20 and 21, he is quoting from uh, the Old Testament. Verse 18, he says, uh, Psalm 19, verse 4. And uh, in verse 19, he is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. And in uh, verses 22 and 21, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 and 2. So verses 19 and 20, Paul sets up the stage for what is basically coming up in chapter 11, that God has taken the message out to the Gentiles. You know, uh, why is he taking it out to the Gentiles? One thing, one reason is to provoke the Jews or to wake up the Jews to the truth. The truth was given to the Jews, but, you know, they refused it, they rejected it. And then the truth was taken to the Gentiles. And now God is using the Gentiles to awaken the Jews to this truth. Okay. So first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Okay. So God is saying, I will use the Gentiles to stir up the Jews towards God, to provoke them, means to awaken them. And verse 20, he quotes from Isaiah, he says, I was found by those who do not seek me. I was made manifest to those who do not ask for me. Okay, so the gospel was preached and it has gone out to the Gentiles. This is something that God had already spoken and prophesied through the prophets. He spoke ahead of time. Uh, part of what he's doing is uh, to the Gentiles is he is when the gospel is being preached to Gentiles the Gentiles are part of the church they're part of the kingdom of God it's sorry it's awakening the Jews to know who Christ is okay verse 21 but to Israel he says all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people so he's again saying that you know even though the Jews were given the truth, the gospel is preached to them, they're being disobedient and stubborn and hard to listen to the message of uh, Christ. So, so this is something that he is, is setting us up for something that he is going to reveal to us, that he is going to talk about in chapter 11. Okay, so that was uh, chapter 10 for us. Anyone has any questions? Because in chapter 11, he is going on to talk about God's plan for Israel. Uh, he's going to share God's plan for sharing the gospel to the Gentiles, is to waken the Jews up, stir up their hearts towards the truth. 
and um, you know uh, so he's basically in chapter 11 is going on Paul is going on to talk about God's plan for the Israelites okay any questions okay there are no questions we have about 20 minutes we'll begin uh, chapter 11 okay so can uh, we begin reading chapter 11 please um, very interesting uh, chapter okay there are uh, basically I think 36 verses right in chapter 11 okay so if all of you can read about um, eight eight verses uh, each please in chapter 11 and then we will study chapter 11. I say then has God cast away his people certainly not for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin God has not cast away his people from his people whom he foreknew or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the, bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. Can somebody else continue reading, please? And David says, Let there, there will become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recom recompense to them, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I said then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failures riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you, gentle, in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and, sa and save some of them, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, that I that will their uh, acceptance be but life from the dead. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. Anyone can continue? Anyone else can continue reading, please? For if the first, ball, the first fruit is holy, the lamp is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them be, became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boost against the branches, but if you do boost, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be hasty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the, the severity of God on those who 
fail sovereignty but towards you goodness if you continue in his goodness if you continue in his goodness otherwise you will be cut off and they also if they do not continue in unbelief they will in unbelief will be grafted in for god is able to graft them in again if for if you were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and we are grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree how much more will these who were natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree amen thank you lubega can somebody continue reading from verse 25 please maybe 25 till the end of the chapter 36 Anyone would like to read from verses 25 to 36? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of riches, both on the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways, past finding out. For, whose, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall repay to him for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory for ever amen then you are muted Let me mute it, I think. It's muted, Pastor. I can't hear it. Okay, Jeffy now is it in, so thank you. Okay, um, thank you everyone for uh, reading uh, and um, um, the whole of chapter 11. So we see that in chapter 11, you know, uh, Paul is basically talking about, continue to talk about God's plan for um, Israel and uh, what he has begun talking uh, in chapter uh, uh, 9, chapter 10. Now he's building on in chapter 11, basically talking about, you know, how the Jews were considered to be the chosen people. They had the laws, they, they were given the laws, the co covenants. Um, they had the forefathers, um, uh, you know, uh, it was to them that God had given everything. They were the priests, they had the priests, they had the covenants, everything. And now, you know, it's the church. So where is uh, 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 the Israelites? So where is the Jewish nation? The, the people of uh, has God forgotten uh, the Jews? So, you know, um, chapters 9, 10, and 11 is kind of a, a detour from what he has been talking uh, previously about sin, righteousness, justification in chapters 1 right up to chapter 8. And how beautifully in chapter 8 he talks about, you know, that... Um, we are able to overcome the power of sin through the power of the Holy uh, Spirit. So these three chapters, chapter 9, 10, 11, Paul does not 
talk about this in such uh, depth, in such uh, uh, detail in anywhere of uh, his epistles. So very uh, important chapters, very unique chapters compared to anything else that he has written in any of his other epistles. So what he's been building up in chapter 9 and 10, he's now building up, uh, talking again uh, in chapter uh, 11. Okay, so um, he's basically here in this chapter, he's talking, he's revealing to us God's plan for Israel. And he's showing us how God's plan for sharing the gospel to the, to the Gentiles is going to awaken the uh, Jews. Okay, so verses 1 to 6, which we read, he begins uh, this part of this letter with another question. He says, has God cast away his people? Okay, now why does Paul say cast them away or why does he say that has God cast away his people? Uh, because the Jews have rejected the gospel. Okay, so because the Jews have rejected the gospel, the gospel or the salvation gospel message is now taken to the uh, Gentiles and God's chosen people are not the Jews now, it's the church. And so Paul says, you know, um, has God cast away his people? And the answer is, you know, he gives the answer, certainly not. God has not rejected the Jews. And then he goes on to say that, you know, uh, reminds the people that, hey, I myself, I'm a Jew. And, you know, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm an example that God has not cast away his people. Okay, because um, I myself, being a hardcore Jew, so to say, somebody was so zealous, a zealous Jew, you know, uh, so zealous in keeping and, you know, protecting uh, uh, the covenants and the law from, uh, you know, uh, and also doing away with Jesus Christ and doing away with his disciples. You know, uh, I was that zealous Jew, but look at me, you know, I'm an example that God has not cast his people away, that he He encountered me and that I have received righteousness, um, my grace to faith, and I here I am as an example. And then he also quotes from the Old Testament. Now we see that Paul is continually quoting from Old Testament because he knows that his audience whom he's writing to are the Jews, and the Jews are well versed with the Old Testament. So he's... Um, you know, bringing about a lot of Old Testament scripture. And also we know that uh, he's quoting Old Testament scripture because, uh, you know, Paul is uh, a very learned man, a well-trained man in the Torah. You know, he studied under great teachers and one among them was Gamaliel. So he quotes uh, various Old Testament scriptures and also quoting because he has to prove from Old Testament what he's saying is something that is, uh, 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 you know, authoritative, something that is uh, right. So he said he's quoting from First Kings chapter 19 about Elijah here. And Elijah had this great victory at Mount Carmel, you know, where uh, God sends on fire and he burns up not only the wood and the animal, uh, but, you know, the stones and the mud, you know, we know that stones and mud cannot be burned by fire, but everything is, you know, literally burned by fire, licked up by the fire, so to say. And after this victory at Carmel, uh, you know, Jezebel hears that so many of uh, the Baal followers were killed uh, by uh, those who were along, uh, who were on the side of uh, 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 Elijah, and then he sends, uh, she sends a message to Elijah that she will kill him, and we see that Elijah begins running for his life. Okay, imagine just after this victory that God gave him, you know, instead of holding on to who this God is and so powerful, gave him that victory on Mount Carmel, uh, instead of being bold and strong, he's, I mean, human again, you know, he runs for his life. And then we see that angel, um, angel ministers to him and feeds him and he hides in the cave. And God asks him when he's hiding in the cave, hey, Elijah, what are you doing here in this cave? And so Elijah is so depressed and so distressed. And, you know, he says, God, you know, they've killed all. I just say God doesn't know God. He's killed all of your people. And I am the only one left here. So he thinks he's the only one left. And so he's trying to uh, save his life, you know. Um, and what does God tell him? What does God tell him? 
how many people has he saved? You know, he says, I'm the only one left, but his, God says, I have saved a remnant of 7,000 men who have not bowed down to uh, Baal. Okay, so in the same way today, you know, Paul uh, is bringing out this example. He's saying, even though there is a widespread rejection among the Jews, they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, and there's a widespread re rejection of the gospel among the Jews even today. Yet, you know, among them, God has a people has a remnant of people who, of the Jews who have said yes to the gospel and so Paul is saying hey I am one of them I am one of them who has said yes to the gospel okay so verse 5 he says even so then at this present time there's a remnant according to the election of grace so he's Paul is saying there are people who are elected by grace now this word elect select chosen beforehand you know has come up again. So the word election or selection must be again understood or interpreted as we have interpreted and understood in chapter 9. And what we said there in chapter 9, that God's selection or his election is not a partial selection of people. It's not selecting some and, you know, eliminating others. It's not discrimination of a few. But, you know, like we studied in chapter 10, you know, all are called. The gospel message is sent to all, but it's only those who believe, who confess with their mouth, believe in their heart that Jesus' is Lord will be saved. And it's those who believe are the ones who are called. And those who are called will be justified. And those who are justified will see the glory of God, like we studied in chapter 9 and chapter 10. Okay, so all who are called, who will say yes or will receive this call, are the selected. It's not that God has already chosen beforehand or selected beforehand some to be vessels of wrath, some to be vessels of um, righteousness. No, it is those who choose uh, him will be vessels of righteousness. Those who reject him will face consequences. But we studied in chapter 10 that God is patient uh, and long suffering not wanting anyone to um, uh, not wanting anyone to perish okay so um, all are called but there are you know not all who say yes or not all who receive the call but those who receive the call are the called the chosen and they're selected so he's already told us about uh, that all who believe and confess with the mouth will receive salvation and they will become the select, they will be, be, be the elect and they are the chosen ones or the ones who are called by uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, So Paul says those who embrace Christ, they receive salvation by grace and they did not get it by works. They're chosen by grace and not by works and so all those who the remnant of jews who have said yes to the to the gospel and paul being one of them he's saying we have said yes to his grace okay so in verses one to six paul is saying god has not given up on israel on a large scale yes the jews have rejected the gospel yet god has not given up on them and they are among those who have said yes to the grace of god and paul says i am one of them and there are others as well okay so we just have uh, two more minutes anyone has any questions now we will not begin studying verses seven onwards but any questions so far? Any questions? No, ma'am. No? Okay. Okay, so if there are no questions, then we'll end class. Like um, I said, I'd like to repeat. Um, I'll release the assessment, second assessment, um, uh, chapters uh, 5 to chapter 8, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, on the 25th, I'll release it by 6 p.m. IST, and you can submit it on uh, 27th, that is October 27th, which is a Friday. So, hope all of you are okay with that, right? Okay, um, yes, okay, thank you, Rosalind.
Hey, thank you all for joining class. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead. I'll see you on Friday. Thank you, everyone.